Um, so I am delighted to open this session on advocacy and policy. We've got three great speakers for you this morning. Um, they stand merely between you and lunch, but they are fantastic speakers. And we are really going to look at cross-jurisdictional cross um, dimensions of advocacy and policy. We have speakers from Europe, speakers from the White House, and we're looking at OER. So without further ado, we are going to move from the Senate to the White House, and I'm delighted to introduce Jerry Sheehan, who's the Assistant Director of OSTP, and I'm going to pass over to Jerry for his presentation. Okay, thank you, and uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction, and I do want to thank Spark for inviting me to be part of the Spark More meeting uh, this year. Um, it was not a hard sell, and even though I was not in Kansas City for the last one to feel the cold, I have to say San Antonio in March seemed like a much better alternative than being in D.C., where we've been digging out of snow all winter. Um, but really, my main motivation for wanting to be here was to actually have an opportunity to address this audience, because I think especially when it comes to issues of policy and advocacy, there is no better audience to address. I think this, uh, the people gathered here, I'll say Spark, the larger Spark community, the library community, academic library community in general, have been among the most dedicated, the most energetic and energized, and I would say the most effective advocates for open access, and what I'm going to call public access in my remarks, uh, among all of the, the, the various communities. And I think, <laughs> yes, really, that would be a cause for you. So, and I, and I think um, it would be fair to say that a lot of the work that people in uh, policymakers in Washington have been able to do, and a lot of the steps forward that we've been able to make, which I'm going to tell you more about in my remarks, have really been enabled by the work that you have done. And it's been advocacy and policy, some of it in Washington when you've been there, or you've got representatives there, some of it's been letter writing campaigns and others, and a lot of it has been the work that you've done in your own communities, your own campuses, your own institutions for advocating, providing support for, outreach, teaching, infrastructure, and so forth that you've put in place to help make public access and open access much more of a reality today than it was just a few years ago. And I want to personally thank you for all of that work that you've done because it has really enabled me and others in, in the federal government to make much greater strides than we would have been able to make. So that's where you deserve really a round of applause is for all of that, that great work. And if I remember at the end, so I'll tell you this now too, in case, in case I lose track as I'm going through my presentation, I also want to ensure that we continue that sort of engagement, right? We've made great progress, but there's still very much more to do. And it's going to be through continued engagement of the various stakeholders. Uh, you saw them on a previous slide during the keynote, the various stakeholders who make public slash open access possible uh, that's going to be needed to carry this forward. So I want to encourage, again, good uh, engagement. If we find opportunities for collaboration, just for me to even better understand some of the pressures you're seeing in your own institutions, your own campuses, that's why I'm here is to kind of listen and look for those opportunities. So with that in mind, uh, between thanking you and encouraging you to stay engaged, what I'm going to do is give you an update on what's happening in the, in the US government. Senate will do what the Senate's going to do. So I'm going to focus on what the federal agencies have been doing in terms of uh, increasing access to the, the results of federally funded scientific research. And if we can get the IT to work. Yeah, OK. You are probably all very familiar with this memorandum, right, which was issued just a little bit over three years ago uh, by the director of OSTP, uh, Dr. John Holdren, who is now my boss. Uh, who was himself personally invested in, uh, in this activity. Uh, this memorandum, which went out to all the, the federal science agencies, instructed all of those that spend more than $100 million a year on research and development to develop plans for increasing access to the results of their funded scientific research. And what we meant by the results of that funded scientific research was the scholarly peer-reviewed publications resulting from it, as well as the digital data that result from that, that funded research. Um, there were some policies in effect. Uh, my previous organization, the NIH, had policies around public access to publications. 
Other agencies, NSF, National Science Foundations, and others had policies around data management uh, to varying degrees. And what this memo was trying to do was say, all of the science agencies need to step up and make these kinds of changes, expand this model across the federal government, which spends on the order of 130 or 140 billion dollars on research and development every year. The objective was, of course, to try to make the, the results of that research more accessible to the variety of communities that can make use of that knowledge. We invest in research to generate new knowledge that can be used to sustain support, not just the science base and the scientific community, but allow us to address challenges related to all the big societal and economic problems that we want to address. How do we get economic growth through innovation and entrepreneurship? How do we address concerns about climate change, energy production, food safety, food security, food production as well, health as you saw in the previous, uh, in, in the previous presentation. So we want to liberate the knowledge so that it can be used by all of those who can make use of it, which is certainly the scientists and the researchers with whom many of you work on your campuses and many of you are yourselves, but it's also people in industry, it's entrepreneurs, it's teachers and educators really at all levels uh, from K through 12, up through, up through academia, and students as well who want to make access to this information. Uh, and it's you know, the, in, the interested and the motivated general public uh, as well. There are many people out there who can make use of this information, whether for their own personal decision making or because they're going to contribute to innovation and training in one form or another. And that's what this was trying to do. And just to put it in a little bit of context, the public access memorandum and what I'll sometimes refer to as our open science initiatives are really part of a larger suite of open initiatives within the, the administration. And you've heard about these from day one uh, in office. The president has been eager to increase transparency into government and its various uh, operations. There are activities related to open government, which is making government decision making and processes much more transparent and engaging the public more in those. Open science is an element of that. You may be familiar with open data policies, which have said for all of that data that government collects, scientific data as well as administrative data and other types of records, we need to find ways to make that data more discoverable, more accessible, and more usable by the public to drive innovation and drive good decision making. And there's been a big push around open innovation which has taken the form of even other directives and memoranda like these that have said agencies should be using more crowdsourcing techniques, more prizes, challenges, and competitions to engage not just those who we know are engaged in the innovation process, but allow a much broader set of uh, participants to engage in innovation. And a lot of the seed that those people are going to use, a lot of the information that can be used in those types of challenges and citizen science projects, it relates to open scientific data and information and public access to that. So all of these things fit together under a frame of openness in the, in the administration. And we're trying to do more now within OSTP and other agencies in making sure that they're mutually supportive and have a good firm basis for sort of continuing on even beyond the end of this administration. Oops. OK. Many of you may know this, but let me just give you the, 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 uh, the, the quick review of, of what that memorandum, when it spoke to increasing access to the results of scientific research, said. And essentially, it was split into two different areas, science, scholarly publications and the data resulting from that, that research and development. On the publication side, what we were looking for was ensuring that the public could access, download, read, and analyze in machine form publications resulting from research with an embargo period as a guideline not to exceed 12 months from the official date of publication, as I think I put on my slide, also with a process for stakeholders to petition, to move that embargo in either direction, consistent with the objectives of the memorandum, which is to unleash uh, innovation and catalyze uh, the, 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 the use of scientific knowledge, um, and making sure as well that, that the, at least the metadata around those publications was available immediately at the time of publication. So we could know what was coming out of federally funded scientific research, even if it might take up to 12 months in order to get access to that public access to that information. On the data side, the issue is really about trying to maximize access to the results of the data resulting from federally funded R&D, taking into consideration all the other factors that might limit the ability to make data fully openly accessible. And that can be, as was said in the, in the keynote, 
issues of privacy and confidentiality, and for the US government, some national security considerations. There are, there are issues around uh, so proprietary interests, intellectual property rights, other proprietary interests of investigators uh, and others who may have prior claims on the data, and taking into account the relative costs and benefits of making data accessible. Think about what gives essentially the greatest bang for the buck in making that data accessible, because there's a long data processing pipeline from the time data are collected off an instrument until it becomes the data that underlies that figure that shows it up in a publication. We're also encouraging the deposit of data in publicly accessible repositories. Let's get them off the thumb drives. Let's get them off the departmental server. Put them in places where there will be uh, access to them and good practices around preservation and archiving of data for the long term. We wanted to make sure as well that the, um, that the cost of data management and data curation could be included are a legitimate expenditure against government contracts and grants. So that's a requirement here too. And I guess I should say that the way that this has been seen as the instrumentality for making this, this happen is through the requirement for these data management plans. Right? So increasingly investigators being required to prepare and submit data management plans that outline what data they'll collect, what are their plans for preserving, long-term preservation and archiving, and plans for making that data accessible and ensuring that those plans are reviewed or evaluated for the, against their merits at some point in the process. Are you maintaining uh, consistency with the objectives of this memorandum and agency policy? Are you at least meeting, if not exceeding, what might be your community's expectations for how that kind of data are treated and how accessible they become? So these data management plans become a large part, a significant part of the instrumentality for making data more accessible and better managed. Okay, so let me tell you where we are in the process. The memo was a little more than three years ago. And at this point, we, uh, we have 16 federal agencies and departments that have issued, completed their public access plans. And you can see them listed on the slide here. This includes all of the major funders of research and development in the federal government, the largest being the, the Department of Defense, the NIH, or part of the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Energy, the Department of um, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. All of them are through. In fact, when you look at the, the percentage of the federal R&D budget that is captured by those agencies that have plans in place already, it's 98% of the, of the federal government R&D budget. These plans are in place. We're working with a few remaining agencies, typically with smaller levels of, of research and development, to get their plans finished as soon as we can so we can move into more, more completely into the implementation process. Implementation means essentially taking your, your plans and putting in place the policies, the language that goes into grants and contract that implement them and put essentially the obligation on the investigators to make their publications accessible and to submit, prepare and submit data management plans as well as thinking about the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure and, and, the, and the human resource infrastructure that's needed uh, to, to, to give life to these, these policies. We're at the point now that on publications, there are more than a dozen of these federal agencies that have policies in place now, let's say for new funding from new solicitations, the publication needs to be made accessible in their designated repository, not more than 12 months after the official date of publication. That's a big step. That's 12, that's 12 agencies, and again, those agencies are in charge of a large percentage of the research and development budget. On the data management side, about half of the agencies that have plans out also have in place now for new solicitations uh, a requirement for a data management plan that says what data, where is it going to go, how will it be preserved, what are the rules, and so forth around access. And that's a significant change in, in three years. Sometimes it seemed kind of slow. Sometimes it seemed we were bogged down in the details of getting these out. But when you think about where we were three years ago, where we had NIH with a public access plan and we had a few agencies with data management requirements, we really sort of turned the, turned the corner on this. And we now have this as becoming the default, the basic uh, approach that agencies are taking. And what you'll see over the course of just the next few months through this uh, fiscal year in government and through the calendar year and then a little bit beyond 
you'll see those kinds of expectations and requirements being included in, in a much larger number of solicitations from essentially all of the federal science agencies, and that's a big step forward. Just to give you a sense on the infrastructure side, there's been a lot of work at designating repositories. For publications, most agencies have designated a repository that they want publications to be deposited to. I think the good news is that there are some 20 uh, plus agencies that are subject to the OSTP memo, and there are not 22 different repositories. You'll see all of the Department of Health and Human Services using PubMed Central, as well as the VA, the Veterans Administration, as well as uh, NIST, NASA, and I think most recently the EPA. You see other agencies that have set up some new infrastructure, uh, typically those on the right-hand side of the slide, the Departments of Energy, Defense, and the National Science Foundation, all using essentially the same technology and systems to build their repositories. And kind of in the middle, a number of agencies that are using existing archives and repositories, many of which were dark, which were part of their own publications flow and approval process before, and now they're extending those to capture the, the publications from the, uh, from the outside community as well. The, the similar situation on the data side is much more complex. As you all know, there are many different places where data reside. There are institutional repositories some of you uh, manage and operate. There are disciplinary repositories. There are agency repositories, and a number of agencies are thinking through their strategy for capturing the data from their funded research. Many looking at that full menu of different options, figuring out what their role is to play uh, in standing up repositories and recommending repositories and thinking about the criteria for what would be an acceptable repository. And I think there's still uh, work to, that can be done there. So a lot of interest now in what's, in, uh, in what's happening. What I want to do, I'm going to just draw back to some experience, right? Again, reminding us, why are we doing this, right? Do we have some demonstrations of success? So I'm going to draw from two illustrations from my previous experience when I was on the staff of the National Library of Medicine at NIH, uh, PubMed Central, right, and the NIH Public Access Policy, which has been in effect as a mandatory requirement since 2008. And when we look at the, the phenomenal growth of PubMed Central as an archive of peer-reviewed biomedical and health-related literature, now more than 3.7 million articles. I think this chart even needs some updating. And in terms of use, you know, more than a million users per day, downloading more than two million articles per day. And what's interesting about it, right, is that if you look at those users, where do they come from? Yes, it's people who are at universities, but it's also people in industry, from businesses, large and small, and it's people who are coming you know, from their home and their home accounts. It's the general public as well. Uh, we can probably get the most recent numbers from Katie Funk, who I'm going to call out in the back of the room as the, pub, uh, the, the, the project manager for PubMed Central. Uh, but I think this is a phenomenal example right, of what can happen when you put, in, put this type of uh, infrastructure in place and the levels of use that I think far exceed any of the, the early expectations for it. And that's true not only with publications, but with data as well. So as, as we talked before, there are variations in the accessibility of data. This genome-wide association study data, right, which is among uh, some of the most sensitive data. This is, these are from studies when NIH was putting a, lot, a big uh, emphasis on studies to look at the relationship between genetic variations and the expression of certain phenotypes, certain diseases or conditions. The data are made accessible for reuse, but with quite a number of, of limitations around them. One, they have to be de-identified, but because of the inherent re-identification re ability of genomic data, also kind of put behind another, uh, another tier of review to ensure that ac researchers who access them uh, have a legitimate research proposal, that it's consistent with the informed consent that was uh, from which the data were collected, and that they agree to a whole series of security and confidentiality requirements. And I think despite that and the number of hoops that you have to jump through to get access to this data, you can see that in the first several years that this, this program was in place, the number of data requests, data from 2013, topped 17,000 requests for this kind of data about two-thirds of which were approved consistent with the, the informed consent. 
And I've heard that since that time, since the study was done on this, the number of requests has jumped to more than 30,000. That's 30,000 requests for data sets, for data that are really hard to get, but are obviously incredibly valuable. And I think these are the kinds of steps we need to take with other types of data as well. There may be certain things that are kind of uniform and infrastructural across the, the, the data community, data identifiers, types of repositories we may put in place. But I think when it comes to addressing some of the questions about my particular type of data, in my field, what are the most valuable data to store? Where should they go? What are the rules about who can have access to them and the timelines for getting access to the data? I think much of that is going to move by looking at particular data types, the drill down type of an option we heard about earlier. And I think this uh, DB gaps uh, and, the, and the genome wide association study provide a, an example of that, which I'll say has been expanded upon to, and broadened to include all genomic data resulting from NIH funded research. So next steps, there's a lot to do. We've made uh, considerable progress, as I said, over the last three years, but there are still many things we need to do both to improve the implementation process around access to publications and data. As I was suggesting, many open questions about data and working with various communities to understand what infrastructure is in place, what needs to be put in place, how do we advance with agencies, universities, libraries, and other stakeholders kind of moving forward to make decisions about the most effective forms of implementation, how do we better coordinate amongst agencies. So I can say from the, the federal agency side, we are now kind of redoubling efforts to do that kind of coordination across the agencies to get more consistency and similarity and identify best practices. And I think the other direction of that collaboration axis is working with the other affected stakeholder communities, again, as this community. And I look forward to continuing to engage with you in that process. I welcome your thoughts and suggestions for how we can best work together. And again, I thank you for all the support you've given to this initiative over the last several years. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was um, fantastic and just so um, kind of inspiring just to see the, the kind of journey. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for, for questions. So if, um, if people have some questions, we have the, the mic here. Um, if they want to come up, sure. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Meredith Niles, I'm an assistant professor at University of Vermont. So I'm in my first year of a tenure track position, and I've spent a lot of time writing grant proposals this year, including a lot of data management plans um, for NSF, USDA. And one thing I'm finding very consistently is that my collaborators, when they write these first drafts, they're not quite getting what this means. So for example, they'll talk about how we're password protecting data on servers, and we're keeping it safe. And they do things like say, we'll publish open access when it's available. I literally just looked at one that someone sent me. Um, access for some people or some researchers. And the language is still really unclear, frankly, especially for some organizations that are requiring data management plans. So I'm just curious, for example, the places that already have data management plans in, in place, how can we clarify this language? Because right now it's very vague, you know, it's, it's about, oh, you should talk about the policies you'll have for reuse or talk about policies for access or plans for archiving, but nothing specific about really what we're trying to get at here. So I'm just curious about what the future looks like for clarifying that. Okay, what? <laughs> Better? Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, so, okay, so I think one of the things we are trying to do across the agency is, is get clarification as to what some of the, the elements of a data management plan should be. And there are some that are out in front of others in terms of what that should be, uh, what elements need to be included in them. So I think the, the NSF has good guidelines. The U.S. Geological Survey and NOAA and places that for decades, right, have been working with their own internal data have fairly sophisticated ex sets of expectations about data management plans. I think what you can expect in the short term is that that kind of clarification will come out and hopefully it'll look a little bit more similar across the agencies, even if not exact, because I think a lot of the, the lessons that have been learned is that there, you know, there are differences in what uh, different scientific communities would expect to see in a data management plan. 
um, and different mechanisms for how best to engage those communities. And I think that's one of the things we want to look into as well. Um, I think I could also say that the, especially in the near term, the clarifications you'll get will be more guidance about what should be in it. But agencies are relying on their, their different review processes. Some are more internal, and some are uh, relying on their peer review process to look at data management plans and provide the kind of feedback or critique that would be necessary to determine whether or not they're sufficient uh, in terms of the kinds of access they're providing. And I think what it takes now is, a, is an elaboration in the data management plan. If it's not going to be open in a, in a very short timeline, of putting forward the argument for why that is. And I think what you'll see is over time, the expectations of the agencies and the communities are going to increase in terms of making sure the data are more accessible uh, and in a timelier fashion. So we might expect some of those RFPs to change in the future, more detailed? I think you, yeah, I think you will see RFPs becoming more uh, specific about their expectations, especially as, as agencies and communities figure out, okay, where do we want this data, for example, to go? Are there established repositories for it? I think in some of the, because many of the agencies are just moving to do this in their extramural programs, the number of, of grants and solicitations that include the language is currently quite small, and they'll be relying on that early experience to figure out how to give better guidance and better feedback to the community over time. And I think that's where looking for ways to engage with the various communities in, in an effective way to help get uh, some form of consensus around community expectations will be increasingly important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next speaker just in the next minute or so, but I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of Spark and the committee for coming and uh, for this excellent presentation this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're now going to shift continents and we're going to uh, move to Europe. So I'm delighted to introduce Susan Riley, who's the Executive Director of LIBER, the Association of European Research Libraries. And they've been instrumental in driving the open science agenda um, forward in Europe. And Susan's going to talk to us about the open science agenda and convergence of policy and diversity of approaches. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, thank you, uh, William. Um, before I start, I would first of all like to thank the, um, the program committee for inviting me here today. Um, Liber um, really has been active at European, European level, active on advocacy for a very short length of time. And, and we think we do um, a lot with very little, but it means a lot. Um, it's a major milestone for me and I think for, for Liber to be invited here to speak at Spark, an organization that has been leading the charge in open access for so long to talk about what we're doing in Europe. So I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today, I'd like to give you an introduction to what Libra is uh, and then talk about how we got to the open science agenda in Europe and, and uh, go over some highlights from this agenda or at least the hot topics right now because I can't cover everything that's going on in Europe or even everything that Libra is working on. Um, I just want to talk, talk to you about what's really happening right now. So. Libre is a pan-European organization representing 420 uh, research libraries from across Europe. And by research library, we mean uh, universities, uh, national libraries, and any kind of library that's uh, providing services to researchers. Um, I guess what's interesting about Libre is how diverse our membership is, especially in terms of, um, I guess, GDP. So. We represent some of the richest uh, countries in Europe, but also some of the poorest. And that really has an impact on, on what we say and, and how we say it at European level, because we really want to represent the diverse community that European Research, research Libraries is. Uh, our mission is to create an information infrastructure that enables research and Libra institutions to be world class. And, and in, in talking about that mission, uh, our message evolved into saying that open science is actually the future of world-class research. If you want quality research, then you've got to embrace open science. 
last year we sort of revamped our strategy and came up with uh, three strategic directions which really shows how important open science is to Libra and um, that it really lies at the heart of what we're doing uh, right now. We're focusing on enabling open science but also providing our members or the, the, with the ability to advocate uh, and to support their researchers in this area. Speaking on, um, on advocacy, we've been I, we haven't had an advocacy strategy, we didn't start out with one because we, we kind of moved into this area because we saw that there were gaps that needed to be filled and that we needed to represent research libraries on these issues at European level. And so we started to advocate before we started to develop a strategy for advocacy. And our advocacy strategy really falls under the umbrella of open science. So we focus on open access, although um, Spark Europe leads in, in, the, in this topic. Um, increasingly on text and data mining and the need for copyright reform, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. Research data management, which is really um, where we started our advocacy work, really um, articulating the role of libraries in supporting research data management and open data. And infrastructure, because uh, at a European level there's a lot of funding going to developing infrastructure to support open science and we have a great diversity of infrastructure. So our role has really been to articulate the needs of our community and the researchers we support in terms of how the infrastructure is developed and made available to end users. So open science in Europe. Europe is, I guess, a complex <laughs> beast. <laughs> to say the least, we, we, I, have to deal with a lot of different European institutions. We have, of course, the national, the national governments, um, but what I deal with are, are, are these three um, entities. First of all, the European Commission, which is really um, responsible for allocation of funding and development of policy and legislation. It's the bureaucratic arm of, of the European Union. There's the Council of Europe, which actually represents the governments of the different countries. And the European Parliament, which approves or, or doesn't approve uh, budgets, um, changes in legislation. And that's made up of elected members from each of the European countries. Um, so the European Commission is the entity that I deal with the most. And they have really been uh, very strong on open science. They launched uh, an open data pilot under their um, recent uh, round of uh, funding uh, under Horizon 2020, which mandates that uh, data from, from European projects must be made uh, open. There's an opt-out uh, clause, so you can choose to opt out if you want, but it seems that a lot of European projects are not taking that option, which is a great sign. Um, the digital single market, which I'll talk about uh, later, but it's actually a very important for us at European level when we're talking about advocacy uh, for open science to get uh, open access, open science recognized as part of the, the digital single market because the main mandate in the EU is to create a single market across the countries. And so we can talk about how um, open access is important um, in, in, in a kind of a and responsible research sense, but actually the most important thing for the EU is, is how open access relates to the market. And the, the European Commission have also la launched um, or announced their intention to develop an open science cloud. And um, you may be asking, what is that? And, and so were we, I'm <laughs> here to explain. Um, the Commission has been great in getting buy-in from the key stakeholders. So the Council of Europe, which is the uh, government representatives, have also re released uh, statements on open science and to emphasise its importance and the importance of the development of a, a unified open science agenda for Europe with, and the associated skills and infrastructure. The European Parliament is less informed on open science, but they will have a say in terms of um, legislation that, that is coming, legislative proposals that are coming up in relation to copyright, which we, which comes under the open science umbrella in Europe, and in terms of what funding is allocated to, to research in Europe. So that's the, the institutions. 
Now, how did we get to open science? If you, if you do pay t attention to international issues, you, you'll know that Europe has actually been very strong in supporting open access over the past few years. There's been a lot of funding given by the European Commission to fund open access. They've manda mandated that the out outputs of uh, European funded projects be, be made available in open access, whether it's by a green or gold. Um, but something happened last year that sort of changed the, the conversation around open science, that took open access from, you could say, maybe a, a sort of a, a silo that, that certain, element, certain agents in the European Commission and the research community were working on uh, into something much broad, broader that cuts across the whole European Commission. And that was uh, the launch of a European consultation on what they called Science 2.0. And this consultation was launched in, in July of last year. And it was a very important moment uh, for us because we saw this as an opportunity to say very clearly that we're not talking about science 2.0, we're talking about open science. And actually most of the respondents, the 498 respondents to this consultation, uh, responded to say that you shouldn't call this open so uh, science 2.0, you should call it open science. And so. It was a clear message from the community to the Commission to, to actually call this open science and bring together these different threads related to open science under one umbrella. Um, so the drivers for open science that were identified by the respondents in the, um, sorry, in the consultation uh, and, and uh, by the European Commission the biggest driver was actually the changes in um, the digital, uh, in, in terms of access to digital information and technologies. This is what is actually driving open science. Um, you can probably see, well you can't actually read the rest very well, <laughs> but the areas where there was less consensus was actually regarding um, citizen science. And, um, also scientific publishers engaging in, in Science 2.0. These were not seen as clear drivers towards open science. The one thing I have to say to you is, you may think that, you may not understand the importance of a consultation for us. We are not in Brussels every day talking to politicians and commission officials. We can't afford to be there. So when they, they launch a consultation that is open to everyone, it's really important for us to respond to these consultations because it's the only time where we are on a level playing field with other stakeholders. It's the only time when those responses are reported openly and we are weighed the same. It's, so it's very, very important to us. And it's also very important to the Commission because then they can be transparent in their policy development. So where were the areas for policy intervention identified in this uh, Science 2.0 consultation? Well, open access and copyright, um, more policy intervention than, than, e than we have even now. Uh, citizen science, yes, policy intervention is needed, but we don't really know what intervention as such. Uh, researchers, careers, peer review and research evaluation, new metrics, and then the um, respondents also added to this list saying that, of course, policy intervention in terms of funding for open access, for the development of skills to support and enable open science and the infrastructure was also needed. Uh, polarity of positions in terms of responses to the, uh, the consultation. You can see that there was a lot of agreement here between the usual suspects, I think, um, primarily research organizations. Um, the agreement that there was need for policy intervention that, um, and this intervention should be impl implemented at European level. And you can see that there is always the one organization completely disagreeing. And, and here as well. So it's good to see um, where the views are because there are some areas where we all agree but also some areas where we um, completely disagree so in terms of mainstreaming open access to publications and data most respondents agreed that there, there was a need for policy intervention at European, le at European level but there were those who responded um, that this shouldn't be the case 
So here's the convergence. We had this open science consultation, and then we had the launch of the digital single market strategy in May 2015, which actually made clear that the European Commission saw open science as part of the digital single market strategy. So now we're about money, and that's when things change. Um, so it made, it, was, it made clear that um, we needed to use, uh, enable the use of digital technologies across the European Union to share open data, to build a data economy and support interoperability and standardization. So in the digital single market strategy, we first saw the reference to the open science cloud. And nobody had heard anything about the open science cloud before this, and nobody knew what it was. <laughs> Um, so this is in May, May uh, 2015. So what is the Open Science Cloud? Well, a few months later, we have clarification. It's a trusted environment for hosting and processing research data to support EU science in its global leading role. Um, and essentially what it is, first of all, is a way to connect the various infrastructures that we have to support open science. So the European Commission has spent, I would say, at least 90 million euro um, on open access infrastructure in the last uh, four years. Um, and, for example, Open Air, which you may have heard of for access to um, open access articles uh, in our publications and repositories. EUDAT is um, an infrastructure for open data, which brings together all of the big data centers in Europe. Um, PRACE for high com performance uh, computing, EGI is the European grid infrastructure, Open Minded is um, an infrastructure for text and data mining in Europe, which also brings together data and content. So we have spent a lot to develop these infrastructures. Now we need to work on making them interoperable. Um, the driver for the Open Science Cloud is that we have uh, open data emerging from Horizon 2020 funded uh, projects and it needs to go somewhere and it needs to be accessible and usable and reusable. Um, and this means that we need to make sure that uh, these data infrastructures are interoperable, that they're not just used by one discipline but across disciplines. Um, and there's a drive for knowledge transfer. It's clear that this data can and should be used by industry and SMEs to develop new tools and technology. But Libra, Libra has been quite strong on the open science cloud because yes, we welcome this infrastructure. We welcome convergence. We welcome those um, infrastructures working together to support interoperability. But if, if you focus on the infrastructure, then you lose a key element of the open science cloud, and that's the open science element. There's an assumption that we're all on board with open science in Europe, but there's still a lot to be done in terms of getting researchers to actually engage in open science, giving them the skills and advocating and promoting their work in open science. So uh, we think there's a need to invest in skills and training uh, to provide local support to incentivize open science, so to recognize those who are not just publishing, but actually maybe just developing algorithms or developing um, open source code. And we also see the open science uh, cloud as a commons, so not some place uh, where these various infrastructures co-develop services, but where researchers can come and build their own tools and services and on top of the cloud. Um, what was also announced in the digital single market strategy was an intention to reform uh, copyright, uh, specifically to reform copyright law to address the issue of text and data mining, which is very complex in Europe and we have um, a great deal of legal uncertainty there. You might question what has copyright got to do with open science, but if, if we can't exploit and use digital technologies to exploit content and use digital technologies, um, then there's a disconnect because um, what, what's the point in investing in making content available if you can't then make, make the most out of it? So Libra has really been uh, active on, on campaigning for an exception uh, uh, for a copyright exception for text and data mining. Here in the US, you have fair use, you have case law which says that text and data mining is transformative. So actually, 
In theory, you don't need to do anything more. In Europe, it's completely different because we don't have legal clarity and because uh, text and data mining can involve the copying of content to change the format so it needs to be, so it can be mined and because we're researchers, we want to store that data so we can reproduce results. We're in a situation where if we want to mine content, we have to ask permission, even if we want to mine content that's available on the web. We can mine content that is openly licensed, uh, but then we will have to uh, use uh, attribution, which is not always possible at scale. So this is what uh, Libra has cam been campaigning on. We've been campaigning for copyright reform and campaigning against restrictive licensing practices. We've been uh, taking the lead, uh, I guess, on this issue, not just at European level, but at global level. And um, uh, in December 2014, we brought together a group of experts from different disciplines um, and also from open access, legal experts, economists, to actually come up with a, what we thought would be a declaration on text and data mining. And we came up with the Hague Declaration. It was in the Hague, the meeting the Hague Declaration on Knowledge Discovery in the Digital Age. And this declaration has six principles, but the first is intellectual property was not designed to regulate the free flow of facts, data, and ideas. Um, and this declaration about knowledge discovery we see as a real, um, it's a line in the sand. It's a line saying where, um, where the, that the free flow of information ideas is an essential human right, um, and it's a catalyst for the production of human knowledge, which underpins welfare and pr prosperity. Um, now, there's a reason to have copyright, but th also there's a reason to have exceptions which protect our rights to access information and to create knowledge. And what's happening with text and data mining is, is going too far in the wrong direction. So we would like clarity in law, which continues to protect our ability to create and discover knowledge. The um, declaration has been signed by nearly 800 signatories at this moment, um, and it has 20, uh, 20 commitments, I guess, roadmap towards enabling knowledge discovery in the digital age. And I just wanted to pull up two because I think they're really relevant to open science and open access. And one is that research outputs be made available in, in, um, under licenses which uh, enable uh, text and data mining. And, and the other is that universities actually implement policies that, and, and advocate for text and data mining. And, and those policies should be in line with open access and open data policies. So a last word on divergence. I don't have much uh, time, but I thought this is what everybody in the US is interested in right now. What is Europe doing on open access? So we had a target set for us in 2012. This is from the European Commission set a target for all the countries in the EU um, to implement, to put in place policies to support open access and open data by 2014. That's achieved. And then that 60% of publicly funded scientific articles are available open access by 2016. And it's the second point that I want to address um, briefly because the approach to this achieving this target in Europe has been hugely diverse. Um, the great news is that we've had great political buy-in in terms of support for open access. Um, I guess the bad news is then that it's the politicians who take up the baton for open access and start negotiating uh, open access publication agreements. Um, and, and the libraries get left out. And, and really, we are the experts in terms of ensuring sustainable access to information. And so, uh, for example, uh, certain countries are, are, are engaging in negotiations with publishers and not making the outcomes or agreements made under those negotiations open and transparent. And this is a a concern for Europe. So we're doing very well. There's lots of buy-in in in terms of supporting open access in Europe, but there is a huge diversity of approaches, whether it's uh, in law, so uh, exceptions which, in, which enable um, researchers to make uh, secondary publications, 
or offsetting agreements or adding more money to the pot to pay for APCs. And this is, this is I guess, something quite interesting for you. So I'm not going to talk about research data, um, but do come and talk to me if you want to if you want to hear about it, and uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm from Europe still, and um, I learned I learned a lot there. That's great. Um, I think we've got time just for for one quick question. If anyone has a burning issue over everything from EU's approach to text data mining, open access. Heather. Um, so in the communication that they um, published in 2012, they committed to spending 45 million euro on access to content and preservation, so open access and preservation, so they did spend that 45 million euro under FP7. Um, and then I would, could say easily that in under Horizon 2020, um, they have, I would say up to this date, probably spent well, they're on course to spend another 45 million euro, shall we say, within Horizon 2020. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask you again to um, show your appreciation to Susan, and I'd like to present this to you on behalf of the program committee. Thank you so much. So. Last but certainly not least, I am delighted to invite one of Spark's own up to uh, the podium. So Nicole Allen um, is the Director of Open Education for Spark and she leads Spark's work in the area of open education. Um, so I'm delighted to ask Nicole up. So hi, everybody. I am excited and grateful to have an opportunity to talk to you today. Um, unfortunately, it's because the original speaker for this slot, Alec Tarkovsky from Poland, somebody I respect and admire greatly, wasn't able to make it. Um, but I, I'm really excited to get to talk to you about advocacy and policy because it's a very large portion of my job at Spark. Um, but looking out in this audience, I see so many familiar faces, and I visited so many of your campuses uh, talking about how to implement open educational resources on campus. Um, and don't often get to talk about the work that I'm doing uh, nationally and internationally on policy. So I'm really excited to have this chance uh, to talk a little bit about what's going on in the policy environment. Um, so I'm going to start out with a quick uh, refresher on what open education and open educational resources are, since this is really the second meeting, Spark meeting, um, since Spark moved into the open education space as an issue area. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of what's happening in the US on open education policy. It has been a historic two years. Uh, where What we've been able to accomplish is re truly remarkable, so I'm excited to tell you a little bit about that. Um, then take a qu quick trip around the world uh, in some of the different policies that are happening in other continents. And then finally, a little bit of discussion about where things are headed next, and I'm going to do that all in about 20 minutes before lunch, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so starting out with open education. So when we say open education, we're talking um, about uh, enco encompassing the resources and tools and practices that are barrier free. Um, so free to access, uh, technologically free of barriers, legally free of barriers, for using them fully in the digital environment. And this intersects directly uh, with open access uh, to research um, because educational materials are both the tools that teach the next generation of scholars uh, how to be researchers. Um, and they're also the materials that communicate all of the cutting edge researchers to the next generation. 
Um, when we're talking about policy uh, with open education, we typically are talking about the resources themselves, open educational resources, um, or abbreviated as OER. Um, and uh, you all know what educational resources are. Uh, they're textbooks and videos and um, even journal articles that are used in an educational context. Um, any sort of uh, tool or, or material that's used for education. And you also all know what open means. Um, um, and open education, it's similar to what we mean with open access, which means free, um, barrier-free online availability with the right to use it. Um, and in the open education community, we re define reuse rights um, with the five R's. Uh, so the right to retain a copy and keep it, the right to reuse it in any context you want, to revise it, meaning edit um, and change things, remix, mix different educational materials together, um, and finally redistribute copies of what you've created. And these five R's really define all of the, the, the uses that you need to fully, um, uh, I guess, do education in the digital environment. Um, so moving on to the US context. So um, those of you who are in the US know that the uh, issue of open educational resources intersects with policy in, in a few very important areas. Um, so right now in the US, we're facing really a crisis in terms of the cost of higher education. Um, students uh, collective, or Americans collectively hold over a trillion dollars in student debt. Um, higher education prices have been rising really rapidly. Students have to take on uh, loans. Um, uh, one writer referred to the millennial generation as generation debt. Um, and part of that is the rising cost of textbooks. Uh, there was actually just a study done that found that students are really heavily relying on federal financial aid to buy textbooks. Um, so we as taxpayers actually have skin in the game there um, in, in terms of textbook prices, which um, have uh, more than doubled since I started college in 2003, which is crazy, um, because I thought books were really expensive then. Um, and there's also the broader context in terms of workforce education and making sure that in today's rapidly changing jobs environment that students are graduating with the skills that they need to get jobs and contribute productively to the economy. We hear this a lot in the election cycle. Um, and uh, having high quality current materials and training programs to um, uh, teach workers is really important too. Um, so that kind of sets out the policy environment in the U.S. around uh, where open education fits in um, as a way to increase the productivity of, of government investments uh, in education and a way to increase access to important educational materials. So the journey of open education in U.S. policy began in uh, uh, really 2009. It was announced in 2010, a program that has possibly one of the goofiest acronyms that has ever been invented, um, <laughs> the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grants Program by the Department of Labor. Um, and this was a $2 billion grant program that was designed to uh, uh, provide workforce, improve workforce training programs for trade affected workers, so people whose jobs were shipped overseas to retrain them in careers that had jobs. Um, and uh, part of this program to extend the impact of, of what um, they were going to accomplish rather than just funding one community college to develop a workforce training program in nursing and that program only be used at that community college. They attached a requirement on all of the grants that any educational materials and other intellectual property developed through this program needed to be released um, a, on a website with a Creative Commons attribution license that allows every other community college in the country, every parent, every student, to access and use it for free. Um, and uh, this program, uh, it's gone through four rounds of grant proposals. All, the first round of materials is already up online at a website called skillscommons.org. One of my favorite examples of the impact that this program has had. Um, one of the, the, the grants that was given out under this program um, went to a community college that developed an energy curriculum, a green energy cu curriculum. And then uh, USAID, another government agency, um, was running a program in Mexico uh, to retrain workers down there um, on clean energy careers. And rather than developing a new curriculum, which they would have done otherwise, they actually used the materials that were developed under the TACT program, translated them into Spanish, adapted them to the local context with a, a much smaller amount of work. Um, and were able to save taxpayers a bunch of money and invest that money in other programs um, 
uh, uh, rather than duplicating efforts. So that's just one example of how um, this kind of investment is, is really important. Um, so a number of federal agencies have actually begun to adopt programs uh, at the program level, this kind of open licensing policy. Um, the Department of State has a couple of programs. The Department of Education has a couple of programs. Um, and the idea is if we're investing in developing high quality, valuable educational materials, those should be available to the public. And it's a similar idea behind what we're talking about with open access um, uh, or public access to federally funded research, except um, in the educational environment, there's really no point making it free unless you're going to make it open um, because it's those reuse rights that make it valuable in the classroom. Um, so that's why we've kind of gone straight to reuse rights and free av availability and, and done that successfully um, within these grant programs. So this kind of was developing between 2009 to 2014, and things really started to ramp up in 2014 with the, um, an announcement by President Obama that he was committing to a set of open education actions as part of our second national action plan on open government. Um, uh, the plan included these words. Um, that the United States is committed to open education uh, straight from the White House, which was really the first uh, time that we had this kind of endorsement. There was stuff happening in the agencies, but this was the first time the White House took a public stance on open education and opened up a lot of doors. Um, and last year, uh, uh, U.S. civil society um, put together a, a very powerful effort that helped move things forward um, pretty rapidly. Uh, a coalition letter signed by over 100 organizations, including 25 Spark member libraries, calling on President Obama to issue an executive action that would call on all agencies to adopt this kind of open licensing policy for all of their grants and contracts that were producing valuable educational materials. Um, and while uh, we kind of knew that that wasn't going to be the end product, um, by issuing this letter, we were able to elevate visibility within the White House, arm our champions within the federal agencies um, uh, with support, strong support from civil society. And um, last fall, in the U.S. release of our third national action plan on open government, included a commitment to openly licensing more federally funded resource, resources. And this sparked a number of uh, really exciting announcements last fall. And those of you that have been following along with the Spark member updates um, and our blog posts know a little bit about this. So the US Department of Education uh, launched uh, the Go Open campaign, uh, which is working with K-12 schools to implement uh, open educational resources um, instead of expensive textbooks, uh, going along with a lot of the president's initiatives on digital education. Um, and leveraging technology to improve uh, 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 college readiness. And uh, along with this, the US Department of Education launched an agency-wide open licensing policy for all of its competitive grants and contracts, um, which is a really exciting move, the first time a federal agency had proposed a policy like this, um, and really was a, uh, an indicator of the, the level of support from within the administration. Um, of course, this, uh, uh, this is the rule published in the Federal Register, and there was a public comment period um, around this where Spark and a number of you um, and other organizations in the space submitted comments in support of this kind of regulation. Um, it was also interesting because it brought out a response from the broader higher education community that um, was a, a little bit more adversarial than I think we expected initially. Um, a number of uh, higher education organizations and research institutions wrote in uh, with comments that questioned the potential impact on commercialization rights and patent rights um, and concerns about author control of materials, which are all common concerns that we hear on campus um, around open educational resources. And um, uh, uh, there's been kind of this divide where the library community is like, yes, open licensing. And the higher ed community has a lot of questions about how specifically it would be implemented and kind of the implications on uh, commercialization programs. And thanks to the great leadership um, of, of ARL, Spark has been engaged in really productive conversations with the higher ed community, working out some of these details. Um, I think with any kind of new policy like this, there are going to be these uh, kind of questions and a need for discussions. And we're just excited that all of the stakeholders involved are really willing to come to the table and have a conversation. Um, and I think we all agree that at the end of the day, the default should be open. And it's just a matter of, of the kind of exceptions and, and details that are necessary to put in place. 
Um, so this is very much the way that things are headed. Uh, the US Department of Labor shortly after Ed proposed its policy um, uh, announced that it had actually adopted an open licensing policy for all of its competitive grants and contracts, which affects a smaller amount of money, um, but still significant. Uh, I, I think it's possible we'll see more agencies moving in this direction throughout the rest of the administration. Um, you know, as we know, we only have nine months left. Um, but I think that there is a lot of momentum and I think uh, having agency level commitments to open licensing and open educational resources is really significant because that has more sticking power. Um, and in the next administration, if these practices are already in place and there's already commitment from the agency career staff that will move beyond the administration, um, I, I think that we're gonna be in a strong position um, in terms of OER. So a couple of quick notes on the congressional front. So uh, there has been, uh, in addition to all of the great momentum within the administration, um, there has been some movement in Congress. Uh, some of you may know, Spark has supported legislation um, that's been introduced in the past three Congresses called the Affordable College Textbook Act, which would create a competitive grant program. Jerry, do you mind handing me water? Um, a competitive grant program to support uh, open textbook programs at colleges and universities. Uh, and it's sponsored by um, uh, Senator Durbin in the, in the Senate, who's uh, currently the uh, Deputy Majority Leader, so a very powerful and important um, uh, senator there. Uh, and um, uh, the legislation uh, really hasn't moved because there hasn't been a vehicle to move it. Um, really, we're looking at Higher Ed Act reauthorization, which is a process that's likely to take um, several years. But having this kind of legislation active is important because it elevates the visibility of the topic and it also drives um, interest at the state level and provides strong model language for states. Um, actually, currently, more than half of US states have active legislation. Uh, related to open educational resources, um, and more than a dozen have passed it, including um, things like adding OER as a, um, a, a performance-based funding metric, funding specific programs to help support OER adoption on campuses, like in Oregon and Connecticut just passed it last year. Here in Texas, there was recently an RFP out for open textbooks in K-12 education. So lots of action at the state level, and that's gonna be somewhere uh, Spark is in putting increasingly more focus on monitoring um, and supporting there. And then at the K-12 level, there actually was a pretty significant development on OER. Um, some of you may know the Every Student Succeed Act just passed through Congress and was signed by the President, with reauthor which reauthorizes um, our K-12 programs, uh, federal K-12 programs, replacing No Child Left Behind. And this included a grant program that, as part of the grant program, open educational resources are explicitly an allowable use of funds. Uh, for districts and states to use to help um, increase, improve the quality of their education, which is really exciting. Um, and we had bipartisan support for that. So I think we're looking at just continuing to develop leadership in Congress and um, uh, looking toward the next administration, the extent to which there will be action, uh, a need for action in Congress. So moving on to the rest of the world, a uh, quick run through here. Um, so up in Canada, there's a lot of exciting action in terms of uh, program level work uh, in British Columbia um, and neighboring provinces. The one kind of policy piece there is, is the Alberta, British Columbia, and Saskatchewan, the three Western provinces got together and signed a memorandum of understanding that they're gonna work together and not duplicate efforts on developing open textbooks, which I think is a really um, significant uh, development just recognizing that you know you don't need to develop an intro to psych book in all three provinces. Probably one of you can do it um, and and share those resources, and that's the beauty of open. Um, something that U.S. states could definitely learn from. Um, over in Europe, uh, so there's the Open Education Europa initiative, which is announced in 2013. Um, and uh, while this slide probably isn't very doesn't paint a promising picture, it says we'll be. <laughs> Um, they're just upgrading their platform, but this, <laughs> um, so this uh, is an online platform for sharing educational resources within um, European nations, and it's also encouraging European nations to, to launch national level uh, OER pro open education programs. Um, Slovenia was the leading country to do this. Um, I think that 
Uh, one of the challenges of this initiative that I hear from my European colleagues is they didn't really specifically define open education, so it's led to a little bit of um, uh, uh, reticence from the open education community to get heavily involved in it, um, but that's just my perception. Um, lots of cool stuff happening across Europe. One thing I want to highlight is in Poland. Uh, they had a national digital schools initiative um, uh, launched by the government where they were actually able to insert an open licensing requirement on some digital textbooks that were being developed um, and actually very successfully were able to create an open textbook that's been uh, used in their K-12 schools. In Australia, in the Pacific region, so Australia and New Zealand actually have frameworks within their governments on open licensing of uh, uh, content that's produced by government employees. In their schools, um, a lot of teachers are creating OER without even knowing it because the resources they create are required to be openly licensed. So a lot of the focus there is actually around implementation um, and, and, and kind of what it looks like uh, to make sure that when these resources are created, they're, they're properly following the policy. Uh, in South America, in, in Brazil, there's been a long-standing movement for open education. Um, uh, I was actually just down there last fall where the uh, local OER coalition organized a seminar uh, for the Brazilian Congress on open educational resources. It was attended by like 400 staff from congressional offices. It was incredible. Um, so they have legislation there that would, um, uh, I, I guess, ensure that open licensing of uh, uh, federally created materials in Brazil uh, would be possible. It's stalled for some of the reasons that we face challenges passing legislation in the U.S. There's a little bit of gridlock down there, um, tension between the president and the Congress. Um, but there's a really strong and robust movement there, so definitely a place to keep an eye on. And then in Africa, there's not a ton of national level policy, but there's some really in interesting institutional policies. Um, so in Ghana, at KNUST, um, uh, it's an institution, they have a very comprehensive policy framework around open educational resources um, that's baked into you know, everything across professional development, career, um, and, and tenure and promotion. Um, so a very interesting uh, uh, test case uh, and something worth looking at. Um, and finally, just thinking about the international context, there are a lot of opportunities in terms of international conversations that are going on right now. One spark is looking at is the Open Government Partnership, which is a multilateral initiative of over 60 countries that make commitments to make governments more open and using this kind of platform to get more governments interested in open education is something that we've done successfully here in the U.S. Um, but also worked with other countries, including Spain and Slovakia, to adopt um, commitments in their open government plans. And we're currently working with the U.S. Department of State um, to organize more, um, uh, perhaps a working group around open education within the open government partnership. Um, and I think it's a really important opportunity here around the sustainable development goals that um, uh, I think Dick mentioned earlier, uh, uh, there's lots of conversation around um, how we implement this vision for education and open educational resources have actually been mentioned um, as part of uh, uh, the implementation documents that the UN is discussing. So just to wrap up, um, I, I think it's interesting. So I, I, we like to say at Spark, uh, my native language is open education, and Spark, some of the other Spark staff, their native language is open access. And one of the kind of striking differences in the policy space is that um, you know there's a lot of focus on harmonization. And with open access policies, I think that the policy mechanisms are pretty clear um, about attaching uh, public access requirements to the people that are funding research, and then it's so important to work out the details to make sure that the procedures and the repositories and the licensing is all aligned. Um, but in open education, we're all over the place. Um, we're talking about different types of policies. Education is so different um, in different contexts. The driver, political drivers behind wanting to um, do open education are totally different. Um, so I, I think really when we talk about harmonization in the open education world, we're talking about figuring out how we can learn lessons from each other and perhaps develop common models and find common uh, commonalities between con uh, contexts where we can implement um, uh, similar strategies and learn from each other's successes and failures. Um, and to that end, um, I was actually a co-author, uh, one of five co-authors on a document 
um, laying out a roadmap for OER strategy. It's something worth checking out, oerstrategy.org. Um, so finally, I just want to say that at the end of the day, when we're talking about policy, uh, policy is only good insofar that it's implemented and changing policy is not the equivalent of changing culture. Um, and whatever we're doing at the federal level or the state level, it, the rubber hits the road on campus. And that's what makes the work that you're doing so important because that's, you know, you know the policies can set the environment, but where we actually make sure that research is made available um, is on campus by working with researchers, by working with faculty um, to actually make sure that educational resources are getting into the hands of students and research is getting in the hands of the people that need it. Um, so thank you all. Oh, I went over time. Thanks, Nicole. That was fantastic, both the U.S. and a sort of whirlwind whistle stop of the of the globe. That's great. Um, it's nearly lunchtime. I think we have time for a quick question, and then I'm going to invite Greg up, who's got some important lunchtime news. Um, so, would anyone like to ask a question about OER and the horrifying state of student debt? No, possibly not student debt. Um, sure, there's a. large institutions and we're trying to kind of get people together to talk about it but having difficulty finding a way into the conversation. Yeah, thank you and, and that's, that's an excellent question. I, I think that um, OER can be a really uh, effective solution to um, uh, textbook affordability. So I think a good place always to start is with your students on campus because they can be a really powerful voice for the need for change. Um, and of course, when you're working on open educational resources, it's important to engage all stakeholders, from faculty to the bookstore to IT to teaching and learning. Um, but I think your students are gonna be the most powerful catalyst uh, for starting that, that conversation. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Nicole um, on behalf of all your colleagues and also for really stepping in at that kind of last moment. It was very much appreciated. It was a great job. So thank you so much. Thank you.